podcast now, and I'm joined today by Marcus Hoffman, the head of business development for the Asia Pacific region for Zollner Electronic. Zollner is a top 15 global EMS, and I'll allow Marcus to do a bigger introduction to Zollner here in just a moment. I wanted to speak to Marcus today specifically about the semiconductor industry and its relationship to the EMS industry. Uh, there's always been a real synergy between these two related industries, and I thought it would just be an interesting to actually speak to somebody in the EMS about this. And, and Zollner, as you will find out, is, has involvement in and can speak to this quite well. So Marcus, welcome. Thank you for joining me today and you. your, your time. Why don't you begin with introducing yourself and Zollner uh, for people who may not be as familiar with it. Sure, Eric. So first of all, thank you very much for having me uh, today. It's a very honor for me to give you some insight on the semiconductor market. So as you already mentioned, I'm working for Zollner Electronics AG. So uh, we are the biggest uh, family owned EMS company in the world. We are under the top 15, as you already mentioned. We have, 15, uh, we have uh, 19 sites around the globe, whether it's from the US, in Europe, and in Asia. And our goal is a little bit to uh, increase our vertical integration, really helping our customers from PCBA level mm -hmm. up to the system assembly, same as we are trying to guide our customers uh, from the whole product life cycle, helping them in R&D activities, in mass production, but also in after-sales services. Mm -hmm. I myself, I work with Zona now since uh, 14 years. During that time, I spent half of my life in Zollner uh, abroad. So I was a project and a program manager in uh, Hungary, in China, and also partly for a couple of months in the US. Uh, since 2015, I'm back uh, at the headquarter in Europe, and I'm now leading the business development team uh, for the Asian Pacific region, which is quite stunning and interesting. And by the way, the semiconductor industry accompanied me in the company since I started. So this is really something I am very happy to talk with you about that today. Excellent, excellent. Well, let's get into that because semiconductors is, is really a leading indicator for the electronics manufacturing industry. Um, you know, I look at the recent uh, forecasts, I had some of them here for the, uh, for the rest of 2020, especially for the semiconductor industry, and it's quite varied, right? They're not as optimistic as they were. Yeah before, but yet when we start talking about 2021, they become more optimistic about that. Um, so what do you see as the main disruptors, maybe we start there, for semiconductor demand, and how do those impact the EMS industry? Well, Eric, uh, it might be not a surprise to you to, uh, I have to mention the COVID-19 situation, of course, yeah. but um, there is also a good uh, story in semiconductor about that, and here is why, because you have to see that the semiconductor industry uh, was uh, already partly a little bit undershipped uh, before the whole COVID-19 crisis started. And um, currently, uh, due to the fact that it was undershipped, um, there are a lot of companies that are you know, partly stockpiling and restocking their demand. So this is why this mm. helps the semiconductor in 2020 a little bit more than maybe in other sectors. Um, the capex in memory, for example, that's of course, it's uh, a rough 30% from the peak. Uh, in the end, you have to say that 2020 is somehow in a flux, but uh, 2021, as you just mentioned, and also 2022, they're looking very promising uh, from the COVID-19 situation, which mm -hmm. is also, of course, a factor is uh, some uh, strategic tensions between uh, uh, several continents, uh, to secure them all the power of the new involving technologies based on semiconductor. But again, also this is something what we see in China right now, it's uh, leading into stockpiling. So all in all, uh, the COVID-19 situation, I think it was disruptive for semiconductor, of course, uh, but it was not structurally negative so far. Okay, interesting. Um, so they're, they're coming and coming out of the COVID-19, maybe that was a, an accelerator of some of these. There seems to be a real emphasis within um, the semiconductor industry, especially towards things like uh, high performance computing, communications, really anything related to high bandwidth, right? And um, what do you see though as the main demand drivers for the electronics in the near, near term? 
Yeah, let's let's stick to that example to the HPC uh, circumstances. So basically, um, there is a lot of indicators who are influencing the drive and the speed of that. But let me just uh, put out three of them. So first one is something which is, I think, really important for all of us. COVID-19 has showed it. It's basically the precision medicine. So what do I mean with that? So if you or somebody, hopefully never, but if you get uh, the diagnosis that you have cancer, for example, Mm -hmm. So if you're in the U.S. today and if you're in Europe, you get different treatments, they have different studies. And what is missing is something like a hyperlink and a link of the doctors worldwide. And there is trillions mm -hmm. of experience and trillions of doctors. HPC is something which can help to accelerate and bundle that kind of data and really help you not just considering the statistics worldwide, but also your personal, let's say, uh, uh, um, history in, in healthcare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is something what might be help you personally, but also mm -hmm. looking at climate change, for example. If you want to really um, um, see how the oceans will develop, how they will interacting in the future, uh, mm -hmm. how much impact that will have on climate change, you need a whole lot of data volumes. And you need that kind of technology like HPC to handle that, to combine it and also compare it with each other. And yeah, in the end of the day, this all leads to as human beings, yeah. and if I see that, for example, all the urban areas around the globe, the big cities, in your case in Texas, it's Houston or LA or Munich or Germany or Shanghai, there are a lot more people who go into these areas. And we do not want to have this urban life, which is full of stress and you never have enough room and you are always in traffic jam. If you want to organize that, you need data for smart cities for example and yep. exactly therefore we need hpc technology because um, this leads to the point that not a human being will be the interacting guy in uh, creating a smart city but the system itself will learn and adapt um, mm -hmm. to the good to the people and in the end of the day that's a benefit for you and all of us uh, in yeah. mankind yeah and that's interesting because you know the Semiconductor and EMS are tend to be kind of cyclical industries, right? And so I think about in hearing what you're talking about and thinking about the industries that aren't going to be doing well, you know, things like automotive and really even the consumer electronics, at least from especially the semiconductor perspective, uh, see that as very diminished both this year and probably into next year as well. Um, and that'll cascade through to the EMS industry too, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So that's definitely true. And uh, to be honest, when we take a look at the figures from, from the, the, the semiconductor itself, it's always has been something like a roller coaster, especially in FAP equipment. So um, if you remember the time uh, before 20, uh, 2009, you always mm -hmm. talked about the cycling semiconductor. It was an up and a down, and yeah. Sony brought up the new PlayStation, and it was an up, and it was a half year down. And if you're really honest, and we take a look at the market, uh, since 2018, or between 2015 and 2018, we anyhow had a growth of 35% in semiconductor. Mm -hmm. Even before COVID, this was slowing down a bit. Um, so, of course, the main drivers is the IT, it's the communication, it's the homeschooling, it's the home office applications. So everybody needs more of that. And that is also, of course, driving the market. That is also an implicator for it. Uh, Last but not least, in 2021, what I saw from the figures, we are really talking about the growth rate of 12 to 17 percent. That's almost 68 billion dollars in FAP equipment mm -hmm. spent. So from the TSMCs and the Samsung worldwide, mm -hmm. and uh, not even talking about the huge good story for the US that TSMC wants to have a site in, in Arizona. Exactly. Same as now Japan turned to TSMC, they also want to have two nanometer sites, five nanometer sites uh, in, in the environment. Mm -hmm. So overall, there will be a huge chip fab uh, uh, volume finished yep. in 2021 to 2022. And in my opinion, that is something which is uh, good for the market. And this is also a good base load for the growth in the upcoming years. No, absolutely. And uh, you know, the electronics becoming so prevalent in all aspects of our lives, and you've mentioned many of those, it just makes sense that the semiconductor, the, the brains of the, uh, <laughs> that makes everything work, yeah. right, is uh, yeah. be, be experiencing the growth. So let's talk about, you know, related to all of this is the fab equipment, right, the actual, the, the, the fab equipment and the spending, the forecast of the spending 
uh, for 2021, they say it's going to reach a new level, that there's going to be a record level of that. So what are the implications of that? To be really honest, in my opinion, the implications for that is really that um, um, the key technologies, what we are needing, so let's put it that way. So if you take a look at the demands, um, uh, what you and myself have, this is the smartphone application, that's the laptops, that's the tablets, but therefore you do not need necessarily the new fabs. So 25 mm -hmm. nanometer machines for the chips that might be totally fine from the TSMCs, the Samsung and so on. But what is really driving that is one example is the data centers around the globe to handle that kind of data volume. And if you take a look at um, what um, the countries are doing, so Taiwan, Korea, they are, uh, give a lot of subsidies to the Samsungs and the TSMCs. They, on the other side, they are investing it into the technology for 5G, for AI, cloud computing, edge computing. And all that together gives me the belief that 2021 will be a record year. Beside that, of course, um, geopolitical topics will also be a factor of that because um, even though there is a risk of overcapacity, but for certain key technologies, I'm pretty sure that the US and China and Japan and Korea, they will safeguard these technologies in their own countries. Therefore, they need to buy new equipment. And that, in my opinion, will lead to a, a very record year in 2021. Okay, very interesting. So, you know, there's been a lot of discussion especially with COVID of the supply chain disruption and everything yeah. that's gone on. And, you know, We've been talking about it a lot of within the EMS industry, but let's look at that within the semiconductor uh, industry. Do you see the trend of a more diversified um, uh, semiconductor supply chain after COVID-19? And maybe more specifically then is, is what is Zollner doing to kind of expand into that space in that business? Yeah. To be really honest, Eric, um, maybe a lot of people will not agree with me, but my personal feeling is that there will be not such a more diverse uh, supply chain, even after COVID, and here is why. So um, for the key technologies, like I just mentioned, the five nanometer technology, even the lower, which will coming soon in a couple of years, following Moore's law, that is something the countries will definitely safeguard to have in their own premises, like in the US or in China or in Japan or Korea. Mm -hmm. But um, when you take a look about the technology, which is related to the smartphones, China and also Korea and Taiwan, they have set up such a huge volume of new chip fabs recently. So, and we all price driven. That means that uh, I think the market will be not accepting a much more higher cost level just to diversify the supply chain. They're always driven from the costs and the capacity is there. And China, Korea, they prepared for that situation for the growth with 5G and with AI. So my mm -hmm. personal feeling is that um, this is something which is not leading into diversity and take Japan as a, as a good example. So the, uh, the Japanese people, they are very often suffering from earthquakes and, and from yeah. floodings and so on. So why are you still there? You're still there because the technology is there, the infrastructure is there, and it's, let's say, easier, more comfortable to deal with that circumstances instead doing the real big volume of work and outsource it into another country. Mm -hmm. So to sum up, in my personal feeling is the key technology for military applications and for 5G, this is what will be more diverse in the future. For um, the, let's say, mass production stuff, for the smartphones and so on, so the more, yeah, let's say, standard equipment in Semicon and the fabs, that will be not the case, so that will remain in, in, in Asia. So I'm, I'm pretty sure about that, yeah. Okay, interesting. So, you know, I get, when I look at the semiconductor and the EMS and you look at the topics and issues discussed, inevitably they're the same issues, right? And the same challenges. It's, it's 5G, it's, it's uh, machine learning, it's regionalization, it's all of these things. So, so what can a semiconductor industry learn from an EMS company or the EMS industry in Europe? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question, Eric. And to be honest, uh, some people might think there is not so much because, you know, Semicon is always quite cutting edge. They are also in front of the technology. But to be honest, what I learned uh, in my 14 years in semiconductor and in the EMS um, serving the semiconductor is really that I saw that um, the vertical and the let's even say the horizontal integration of mm -hmm. all the chip fabs of, of the equipment is not that good like in EMS. So we guys in EMS, you know that better than me, I guess. So we have to deal with the aerospace certifications and uh, demands with the healthcare, with the automotive, semicon, 
military applications. We have to be very flexible. How we are doing that? We are achieving a digital transformation guided from Industry 4.0, from smart manufacturing, and from linking and combining topics. And this is something I talked recently a year ago at the Semicon show in, in, in uh, Kuala Lumpur. I was invited to the Head Generous Integration Forum. And you know, these guys are really the uh, Corey face and uh, the, the kings of, of, of that kind of semiconductor mm -hmm. field. But they really didn't have been so much aware about smart manufacturing approaches, you know, digitalization, mm -hmm. automation. So in my opinion, if you ask me to give a short answer, the horizontal integration of process steps into a real big one thing, uh, this is something what Semicon can learn uh, from an EMS company. Interesting. So circling back to what uh, we talked about before with the forecasts, how do you see the semiconductor industry forecasts aligning with the EMS industry forecasts that are coming out? Yeah. So basically, recently, I think it was two weeks ago, I saw a statistic from Credit Suisse. So that statistic said that the total cost of goods, if you are summarizing mm -hmm. Agriculture technology, server, uh, uh, cent, data center, mm -hmm. automotive, so everything which is somehow related to electrics. It's a global cost of goods of 43 trillion US dollars. If you right. accelerating that into the semiconductor business, that is an addressable market for semicon of 750 billion US dollars. Yeah. So even only that message and that uh, number should give us confidence uh, that uh, semicon will grow. And as mm -hmm. IST, Semicon, and the EMS industry, we are approaching the same sectors. We are approaching the healthcare sector, we are approaching the industrial IoT, we are approaching automotive, so all of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my opinion, that gives me really a high confidence that uh, both businesses will do very well recently. Maybe in 2020, the Semicon will um, be doing a little bit better than the EMS. So our yeah. figures are not that bad, but all of us, we are a little bit yeah. suffering. But in 2021 and 2022, uh, this is something which I believe we will fully recover both. And we, as you just mentioned, we, I think we can link the forecasts from Semicon and IMS to a certain mm -hmm. extent, because we are penetrating the same markets in the end of the day. No, precisely right. Um, and within that, with the markets and the trends going on there, what are the unique demands that issues like 5G and the, the IoT and everything related to AI, you know, places on the EMS industry? So in my opinion, uh, first of all, I think when we take a look at the 5G, there is some people still think that this is good for your personal device. So you, mm -hmm. but on the, if you're really honest, if you have 4G, it doesn't matter because you can watch your YouTube video in the same speed like with 5G. Your download for 100 megabytes maybe takes you two or three seconds more or less. So the really implicator and the importance for 5G beside autonomous driving is the industry. So we really need to interlink our factories. We need to optimize our processes. We have to handle a whole bunch of data. Of course, the data needs to be good because bad data or you can throw them away. So the quality of the data is as of importance, but also uh, the mass of data. And if you want to collect the data, when it comes to uh, um, uh, uh, refurbishment activities or predictive maintenance, you need that kind of infrastructure. And this is something which is re very much related to the industry, not just to the semicom, but also to the others. And my personal opinion, what I also see is that when we talk about 5G and AI and cloud computing, sometimes we a little bit forget the edge computing portion. Because um, if you are in a, an autonomous car, you do not have time 30 seconds until you know, uh, the uh, cloud gives you the signal that you make the uh, uh, takeover or not. So therefore you need the edge computing. And exactly. this is something which in my opinion um, is important for the market and also important uh, for the EMS industry. Mm -hmm. The only thing in addition to that, what you mentioned I see is that there might be a chance to also use 5G on millimeter wave on the campus. So, you know, not in the, in the big size and in the whole country or in whole area or region, but mm -hmm. on the campus, if you use the millimeter wave, which is of course, the distance is shorter and you could not have so much interference, but that would make the data even faster. And again, this is leading to linking our campuses, linking our production lines, linking our data, And that's good for all of us because we are faster, we can predict more, 
and we can change faster. And this is what the market is demanding in the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to another issue, and you, you teased it a bit in one of your answers previously, but that about kind of, there's, um, we hear about disruptions in the uh, fab industry with discussions of major fab companies moving into yep. other geographies. You mentioned the one with TSMC, I believe it's in Arizona here in the United States. Yeah. Um, uh, we've also seen announcements from global foundries. I think Samsung's had something as well. Um, what are the implications of that in your mind? Of them diversifying such, because if I look at the numbers globally, and you know these as well, if yeah. you look I think it's 47% of is still the U.S. You know, Europe's considered about 10%. China's at 5%, right? So, uh, so what are the implications of this moving forward? So, um, as I'm mainly uh, uh, dealing and responsible for the Asian Pacific region, I have to add on that that um, uh, what China recently did is that they are focused on an issue. And the issue in the past was that the consumption of ICs and the own production in the country of ICs, it reached a gap of 155 billion in 2016. So this was, let's say, uh, let the Chinese government and the people there ringing an alarm bell and say, hey guys, trade tensions becoming more and more serious. Yeah. We need to have that, that technology in-house. We cannot import it anymore. So what the guys did is that they really set up um, huge volumes of chip fabs, new ones, with uh, five nanometer technology, standard ones with 25 nanometer technology. The, the result is that there is a huge portion of chip fabs in, available in, in China. But, mm -hmm. and this leads to the point you mentioned, why is the, the market share also in, in, in the, the, the portion of research and development yeah. not that big there? Yeah. It's also somehow simple because China currently focused on building fabs. The chip designs and the research and the development is still done in, in whether in Europe or in the US and also in Korea and in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. so just one example. So yeah. the market leader in lithography, for example, he is able to do five nanometer chips with a clear strategy to reach 1.2 nanometer in six or seven years. The best equipment manufacturer in, in, in China, which is uh, SMEE, they are able to do 25 nanometer in the end of the day, which is far away. And we all know in Simicon, you cannot close that gap in one or two years. That's almost impossible. Yeah. So um, to coming back also to your main question is that my personal feeling is that um, even so, for example, Intel lost market share in the US due to the, the engagement of TSMC in, 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 in Arizona, there might be some chance to, to get back on track. Uh, and if I took a look at Korea and in Taiwan compared with China, yeah, these two countries, they're almost living from the semiconductor industry, especially Taiwan. So the government, they will do everything. They give every subsidy. They will invest trillions into that industry to secure, to have the knowledge in-house. Right. And somehow, currently, I see that China has found his freedom with that. So they are, of course, they are working more on chip design, but priority one at the moment is capacity. And that is what's also driving the market, as we just mentioned before. Yeah. And it's interesting, even with the, the move into the TSMC in Arizona, the concern, of course, is having, having uh, skilled labor to, to do that type of work. And you know, the concern is, does that even still reside in, in the United States? Will they be able to, to, to staff it effectively? So yeah. challenges related to all of this, not just putting a factory in place. Definitely. And if you, to, to also coming to that point, so uh, um, I see it a little bit in the, in the same direction because you know, uh, the U.S., when you take a look at the Silicon Valley, so where we are also located. Mm -hmm. So these guys have been disruptive and really cutting edge in technology for a very long time. They are still, but it's extremely hard, and that's why we are there to help that kind of customers, extremely hard to find manufacturing uh, uh, knowledge and skills in this area, simply because the U.S. have outsourced a lot of stuff over the last decades and not so much remained in the country. So if you cannot find a job as an a test engineer or a test architect, where you should go for that profession. In my opinion, um, if they do uh, the right direction and they still have a little bit time in Arizona to establish apprenticeship models or getting people trained in, in Taiwan, for example, mm -hmm. that could help. And in the end of the day, as I mentioned, for key technology, that might lead into a more diverse uh, supply chain. And to be honest, for the global market and for the competition, I hope that the U.S. will do well with that because, you know, 
if there is a competition in Arizona and you have the same possibilities in Europe and in, in China, for example, it's some kind of a local for local approach. So you don't have to deal so much with custom duties anymore if you can have it better there or there. That's mm -hmm. our Zoyna way of working to be there where the customer needs us. And maybe the chip industry is doing the same, would be great. Yeah, no, that's very good insight. So let me ask, what new about the business models here for the EMS companies? Um, so what are the new business models for companies in relation to semiconductor manufacturing? Um, what, what are those that you think will come out and, and how is Zollner engaged in doing in this area? So uh, uh, two of them I already mentioned. So it's um, the, let's say the early involvement, which more and more uh, semiconductor mm -hmm. customers want to see from an EMS company like Zollner. So simply going one step in front of the product lifecycle to talk with the customer about design, about optimization potential. So this is what they are facing and want to have more and more. Let's say a couple of years ago, this, they have been a little bit, no, not, not say paranoid, but they had very, very careful about letting others involving their design. Now they see that they can, uh, uh, it could be an added value for them to participate from our know-how we created all over uh, uh, different sectors. That's one. And the other one, of course, is the digitalization approach. If we can make it that uh, we are included in um, the digital flow of the chip fabs, of the fab equipment suppliers, the EMS companies, our sub supply chain, we really can help to optimize designs and speed up in time. And you know, time is always critical for semiconductor. Yeah. But the most interesting, in my opinion, as at least this is what we see at Zollner, it's the off the service market. Um, you might think, how could that be happen? But what we saw recently is that a lot of semiconductor companies, they're losing market shares in uh, off the sales. And it's not so much the revenue which is uh, bothering them that they lost the revenue. They're losing the link to the design. Because if in China, for example, a mama papa shop is doing the repair for a, I don't know, wafer table or something else like that. Um, Nobody knows, uh, is the boy and the linear guide, was it uh, active for uh, uh, 10,000 hours or 15,000 hours? Mm -hmm. So they never have a link to the design which they can implement to optimize their products. So now they want to get this back. And who else than an EMS company who is really good in um, organizing a shop floor, doing repairs, making really mm -hmm. deep dive analysis whether I repair it or I scrap it which some semiconductor companies cannot do so properly. Who then else than an EMS company could type on that? And this is what we are working right now to really set up a new uh, kind of infrastructure with uh, um, augmented reality solutions for the service technicians, for repair instructions on the tablet, for really giving the customer the experience to say, okay, that product is broken now, but it's broken because it was used in that region and in that region, for example, uh, it, this happens twice that often than in other region. So again, making a digital business model based on um, off the sales, and in the end, that will lead to a better design at the customer, a better product and a better spare port flow, and it will save money in the end of the day. And that's all about. Yeah, that's it. You know, you, your comments make me think about who the customers are for the EMS in this, right? And that yeah. and that's changing some when you see some. But so I think of the. The, 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 the fabulous companies, right, and, and the ones who are doing that. Think about the equipment manufacturers who are doing that. And then you hear about the companies, the big tech companies like Google, I think Apple too, who want to develop their own chips now too, yeah. right? So who your customers are, uh, that's evolving and changing as well in this environment. So um, Zollner was for a very, very long time in Semicon, and by the way, Semicon is very important for us, uh, engaged in the back-end business. So we did a lot of pre-measurement systems and uh, bonding systems from ball bonding to die bonding for several global active customers. But recently, we also did a step into the front end. And I'm happy to be allowed to share the name with you. It's the huge and very famous company in the Netherlands called ASML. And what we mm. did is that uh, we uh, created um, a 2,000 square meter clean room in Germany recently um, grade seven, so uh, 25,000 dust per tickle per cubic meter. So it's quite an high and intensive uh, specifications we have to follow. 
And not just this, we will really try to do the same approach in the US where we already started and also in China, which we will start very soon, to really serve them as a best cost country partner around the globe. And that makes us very proud. Um, um, when you look at what the market shares they have and uh, the, the cutting edge technology they're using, um, that is our new way of working in Semicon. So this history was back end, we're still growing there, but now we are also approaching the front end and uh, our target is to really be a partner from the silicium until to the back chip. And that is really our target in, in Simicon yeah. and Sonia. That is very interesting. And I, I think I'll be, I'll be watching for further developments out of Zoner on this. It sounds like it, you're in a, in a good position there and in, in, in yeah. an industry that clearly is, is going to be doing better. Um, Marcus, I want to thank you. We could go on, but I think it's best to maybe, you know, and here, I want to thank you for your time, for sharing your insights. I think that this is an important issue, and I think that viewers will find, you know, this conversation to have been a very good one. Um, very welcome, Eric. Thank you for the invitation again, and it was a real pleasure to talk with you. And as you mentioned, we could talk for another decade, uh, but maybe we should do that when we meet you next time in Germany. Then we also invite you to our clinic. I would love to come and see that. But let's, so let's stay in touch, and please stay safe out there too, Mark. Stay safe, Eric. Thank you very much. Have a great day.